Episode four: Water quality testing. So we know that the future of fresh water availability is a hot topic all over the globe. Scientists monitor drinking water as well as fresh water ecosystems regularly to determine trends in water quality. Good water quality is important not only for us to be able to drink and use, but for all living organisms in our planet. Changes in water quality can be detrimental to ecosystems and populations of organisms we rely on as food sources. In order to keep tabs on water quality in local ecosystems, like our stream on school campus, we use three different types of water quality tests. Physical tests. All rivers and streams are different. These differences result in a range of biodiversity found in each individual body of water. Some stream beds are more mud or sand-based, while others have a more rocky substrate. These differences in stream beds will impact what type of organisms can survive in the stream, as it impacts what habitats are available, speed of water flow, and weathering and erosion rates. We also look at the banks alongside the stream. Beyond that is the floodplain and the riparian zone. These parts of the stream, while not necessarily in the water, are incredibly important in maintaining high water quality levels. Plants in this area can provide shade and cycle nutrients, act as a buffer for pollutants entering the stream, while their roots hold the soil together to prevent erosion into the water. Erosion rates are also impacted by stream flow. This is impacted by all of the other physical aspects of the stream, including stream bed substrate, depth of the water, width of the stream, and roots and plants along the banks of the water. Temperature is also a physical test to determine water quality. Cold water holds more oxygen than warm water, so we tend to see more hypoxic areas during the summer months. Quick temperature changes could also indicate pollution. Turbidity measures the cloudiness of the water system. The cloudier the water is, the harder it is for sunlight to reach the bottom of the body of water and therefore limits photosynthesis rates. We measure turbidity using a secchi disc or tube depending on the depth of the body of water. Erosion is a large contributor to high turbidity levels in all bodies of water, even here in the Chesapeake Bay. Chemical tests. The pH scale ranges from 0 to 14, with lower numbers being more acidic and the higher numbers more basic. Most streams have a neutral to slightly basic pH of 6.5 to 8.5. If stream water has a pH less than 5.5, it may be too acidic for fish to survive in, and a pH greater than 8.6 may be too basic. Yeah, basic. Dissolved oxygen, DO, is a measure of how much oxygen is dissolved in the water, or the amount of oxygen available to living aquatic organisms. It enters the stream mostly through the atmosphere and is circulated through moving water. Different organisms require different amounts of DO, and without it, hypoxic conditions arise, creating dead zones. Nitrates and phosphorus are essential plant nutrients, but in excess, they can cause significant water quality issues. Nitrates dissolve quickly in water and are an indicator of possible sewage, runoff, decomposition, or other pollutants from nearby land. Together with phosphorus, nitrates in excess amounts affect dissolved oxygen, temperature, and other water quality indicators. Phosphorus is limited in most freshwater ecosystems, which means a slight change can throw off the whole food chain. Biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD, is a way to measure organic pollution in water by looking at the rate at which microorganisms use up dissolved oxygen when they metabolize the organic pollutants. The greater the BOD, the more rapidly oxygen is depleted in the stream and available for aquatic life. This can lead to stress, suffocation, and death. Sources of BOD include decomposing plants and animals, manure, and runoff from wastewater treatment plants, feedlots, and stormwater. This leads me to the process of eutrophication. This process occurs when too much nitrogen and phosphorus get into a body of water, usually from runoff, and cause a dense growth of algae and phytoplankton. The algae bloom, then die, and as microorganisms take care of the decomposing algae, they use up all the oxygen available in the water. This then causes dead zones that lead to fish die-offs, as there is little to no oxygen available for them to survive. We have dead zones all over the world, mostly in places with large watersheds and higher chances of runoff impacting the health of the water, such as the Mississippi River or the Chesapeake Bay watersheds. As I mentioned earlier, we tend to see larger dead zones in the summer months because the water is warmer and oxygen levels are lower to begin with. We also have more activities on land, such as fertilizing our lawns or agricultural runoff, which also impact the amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus making their way into our streams and rivers. The dead zone in the Chesapeake Bay shows up every year and is mostly isolated to the deepest areas. Biological tests. We also perform biological tests in the stream 
to determine the amount of the type of plant life, algae, fish, macroinvertebrates in the water. Macroinvertebrates are any animal lacking a backbone, but are large enough to see without a microscope. Usually, the ones we find in the stream are juvenile forms of terrestrial insects. These are important parts of the aquatic food web, and their biodiversity can indicate pollution, as some organisms are not as tolerant of pollutants as others. Biodiversity is an indicator of healthy ecosystems everywhere, so finding a variety of organisms is very important. Pesticides, fertilizer, soil erosion, road salt, and other pollutants run downhill during rainfalls and find their way into our freshwater streams, rivers, wetlands, and eventually into our oceans. Elevated levels of these contaminants can create those dead zones we were talking about and eventually can harm humans as well. There are other tests we can perform on our local streams, such as salinity and fecal coliform, which measures the bacteria found in digestive tracts in humans and other animals. Ooh. Salinity is the measure of the salts dissolved in water. Salinity levels control the types of plants and animals that can live in different areas of an estuary, where salt and freshwater ecosystems meet. High levels of fecal coliform are usually indicative of animal waste, untreated sewage, or septic tank pollutants, and are incredibly important to monitor in freshwater ecosystems, as this can be very harmful to humans. We monitor freshwater ecosystems regularly in the United States. Similar tests are used for streams, rivers, bays, lakes, oceans, and all surface water ecosystems. We also monitor drinking water to ensure safety for human consumption. These monitoring programs are not internationally the same, and improving these monitoring abilities would provide dramatic progress in sanitation and drinking water in areas all around the world.